Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be trying to explain the Euclid's algorithm and I just want to show you a very simple illustration which actually makes it really simple to understand. Okay, so real quickly, uh, real, why is this algorithm usually used? So we use, use this to find the greatest common factor or some people call it the highest common factor. So real quickly, what does that mean? So let's say you have two numbers. So let's say we have the numbers 20 and 10, right? So we want to find out what is the highest common factor between these two numbers. So one simple way that we can actually do this is by finding the factors of these numbers, okay? So real quickly, uh, so let's just factorize 20 and 10. So I'll just do that real quickly. So the factors that you have for 20, you're going to end up with 2 into 2 into 5. So that's its uh, prime factorization. And for 10, you're going to end up with 2 into 5. So a very simple thing we can do is just take out the common numbers between the two. So let's take out a 2 from here, a 2 from here, and a 5 from here, and a 5 from here. So the common factors is going to be that, which is exactly 2 into 5, which is equal to 10. So 10 is going to be our highest common factor or the greatest common factor. So a small reason this is not the best approach is because when you get really large numbers, what happens is we don't actually have a proper or simple way to find the prime factors of it. So that's going to be a very expensive process. So we try to uh, avoid or skip that. Okay. So that's one approach. And another approach, which is uh, basically we, uh, one thing we have to observe is that let's say given two numbers, in this case, 20 and 10, the highest common factor cannot be greater than the smallest number. So in this case, the highest possible value we can get is the smaller number of the two, which is the number 10. And in this case, what we can do is we check each of the numbers. So first we have the number 10 and we check if 10 is divisible by 20 and 10. In this case, it is divisible. So 10 is going to be our highest common factor. So just for the sake of it, let's say we have 22 instead. What we do is we would first check with the number 10. 10 is not divisible by 22. So then we uh, decrease it by one. So then we have nine. We keep doing it until uh, we have a number that is divisible by both of them. And this would actually go all the way down to the number two. Okay. And two is going to be the highest common factor in this case. Cool. So this is actually the two methods that we could use. And now let's come on to the third method, which is our Euclid's algorithm. And this also scales really well with large numbers. So to actually, you know, uh, perform this algorithm, I just want to show you a simple way to think of these numbers. So let's say uh, the number four. So think of the number four made up as blocks with the number one. Okay. So each block represents the number one. So how many blocks would you have? Well, you would have four blocks, right? Pretty straightforward. So another way to look at it is you could think of each block having a representing the number two. In that case, you would have two blocks, right? And another way is you would have just one block representing the number four. So essentially what we're doing is we're thinking of each block as one of these representations, okay? So the number four could be four ones, or it could be two twos, or it could just be one four. So essentially we want to find the highest common factor in this case. So in this case, obviously it's the number four, but now given two numbers, how exactly are we going to do that? So what I'm going to do is let's take two other numbers as an example. So let's just say we're taking the numbers 32 and the number 12, for example, okay? So I'm going to do the same thing. So we have the number 12 and we have the number 32. So let's say we have one block representing the number. So this is the number 12. And the, let's, let's just say the number 12. So the highest factor just for the number 12 is the number 12 itself. And let's say now we have another block representing 32. So I, I did not draw it to scale, but just around the same idea. So now what we want to do in very simple words is we're going to first consider that the first uh, factor we have is 12, right? Because that's the highest possibility we could have. So essentially we want to see if 12 is divisible by 12. Well, it is. And 12 is actually not divisible by the number 32, right? So 32 divided by 12. So essentially you're going to get the number two, right? So uh, what is that? So two, uh, 12 is going to be 24. And then let's just do 32 minus 24 to get the remainder. So this would be 1, 2, 0, and that would end up with 8. Okay, so we have 2 with a remainder of 8. Okay, so what exactly does this represent? So it's very simple, right? So this number 12, so I'm just going to represent it in the color pink, for example. We know that this number 12 can go inside of 32 
for a total of two times. So this is the first time, and this over here is the second time, okay? So now what happens now is after it goes in twice, we have a small remainder over here. And this remainder is the value eight, okay? So now what we're gonna do, so this is gonna be our first iteration. So now we move on to our second iteration. So this is where we actually get the basic algorithm, the Euclid's algorithm itself. So in this case, 12 goes into 32 two times. So now what we do is instead of looking for the highest common factor between the number 12 and 32, what we do is we look at the highest common factor between the number 12 and the remainder. And the remainder in this case is eight. So why exactly does this make sense? Okay, so this is the basic reasoning. So this, whatever uh, factor we're looking for, has to fit the numbers 12 and eight, okay? Now, when we know a factor fits the number 12, right? So in this case, we are looking for a factor which fits both 12 and eight. So that means that if something is able to accommodate for the number 12, it automatically is able to accommodate for this entire part, which is nothing else but two 12s, right? So if one 12 is being accommodated for, we can also accommodate for these two 12s. At the same time, we also get the value eight in this case, because we're also looking for a factor which comes for eight as well. So in that way, we're able to accommodate for two 12s and the one eight, okay? So I'm just gonna further uh, iterate this and let's see how this looks like. So let's say this is the block for 12, for example, oh, actually, this is the block for 12, and obviously eight is gonna be slightly smaller, okay? So now we do the same thing. And again, the highest possible common factor here is going to be the smallest number between the two, which is the number eight. So in this case, how many times can eight go into 12? So, well, that's actually just gonna be one time. And over here, we're going to have another remainder and that's going to be four. So we're gonna have a one eight. So this is gonna be one eight, for example. Right, let me just change the color. So this over here is one eight, and we're gonna have a remainder of four in this case. So now we do the same thing, okay? So essentially, we know that one eight goes into 12. So now we wanna account for that remainder part and the value 12 itself, because the logic is same. If something is able to fit into eight, it also accommodates for this part. And we're also checking for a highest common factor for the number four. So we can get both of these parts, okay? So essentially, we're recursively breaking it down into a smaller part. So first, we broke this 12 and 32 into eight and 12. Now we're breaking this 12 and eight further down. So essentially now we're going to have four and eight. So four and eight are our next two numbers. So let's say this is four and eight is going to be this. So now in this case, let's actually divide them. So how many times does four go into eight? We're taking the smaller number again, same logic, right? So four goes into eight exactly two times. So this is actually perfect. So it goes once over here, and this is the second time it goes here. And the reasoning is, well, basically four into two is equal to eight. It's perfectly divisible. So in this case, we found out that the number four perfectly fits into the number eight. Okay, so now we found the highest common factor between four and eight, which is the number four. And essentially that is going to be our final answer that we return. And as you go up, this is the same thing. So essentially this number eight is nothing else but two blocks of four. The same way the number four is nothing else but three blocks of four. And finally, the remainder four is accounted for with the same block of four. So now let's move up another step. So at the 12, so 12 is nothing else but uh, four times three. So four blocks of, sorry, three blocks of four. So the number 32 over here is going to be made up. So let's see, so 12. So 12 is made up with four, uh, three blocks of four. So this over here has three blocks of four. This has three blocks of four. And now we need to account for this eight. So the eight is gonna take two blocks of four. So now the total blocks of four over here are nothing else but three plus three plus two. So that's six, eight. And in simple words, all that's telling us is that eight times four is equal to, well, the number 32. So essentially we just recursively break down this problem to a point that it is perfectly divisible. So the remainder over here is zero. And that is going to be our highest common factor. So now real quickly, let's see what this looks like in code. All right, so the code for this is actually gonna be pretty straightforward. So we're gonna actually keep track of two variables, A and B. And uh, so in the beginning, right, A is 12 and B is 32. 
So this is how we kind of break it down. And A is always going to have a smaller value, all right? So let's say first 12 and 32, and then A now gets the remainder of that, right? Which is the number eight, right? So this is the same example we use. And now we look at eight with that earlier smaller number. So between 12 and 32, the smaller number was, well, it was 12. So now we have eight and the number 12. So now we look at its remainder, which is four. And now we get the previous A value, which is eight, okay? And now we do the same thing. So now in this case, the remainder becomes zero and the value of B becomes four. So whenever A has a value of zero, that means it's perfectly divisible. And in that case, we just return the value of B. So let's, uh, so that's gonna be our basic base condition, okay? So we're actually gonna define a very simple function called GCD, and it's gonna take in two values, A and B. So like I said, the base case here is if A is equal to zero, then in that case, we're just gonna return the value of B. Now, if this is not the case, we had to recursively call this function, and essentially, we just wanna to try to replicate or simulate this, right, the exact same thing. So now the new value of A, is going to be b mod a, sorry, b uh, mod a, there we go. Okay, so now the second value, so a now becomes b mod a, and now the new b is going to be the old b's value, a's value, sorry. So the old a was 12, and now the new b becomes 12, okay? So right now, uh, where that's going to be the basic value, so that's gonna be a, okay? So now let's run this, so let's just try out a simple example. So let's say gcd, of 12 and 32. So uh, let's run it. And as you can see, we get number four, which is exactly what we're looking for. So real quickly, just to show you, uh, so let's actually try this out. So let's say we're doing this with the numbers 32 and 12 instead. So this actually might be a little bit confusing because we kind of said that the smallest value is always going to be an A but this is actually still going to work. So let, let's see why. So we get the value for for both of them, which is correct. So essentially what happens is, real quickly, let's just show, let me just show you. So let's say, let's do 32 mod 12. Sorry, not the other way around. So it will be 12 mod 32. In this case, 12 mod 32 is, well, it's gonna be 12 because 32 goes into 12 zero times and the remainder is just going to be 12. So essentially, let's say I give you a value of A and B which is flipped, right? So let's say A and B. So let's say A is 32 and B and B is 12. Now in this case, what would happen in the first step, these values would get flipped around. So 12 would come here and 32 would go to B. And now from there, we continue the same steps. So in this case, it doesn't matter if A or B are, uh, which one is greater in the first step, because after that, it's just going to correct itself. So that should be it. Do let me know if you have any questions and thanks a lot for watching.